what I do uh, remember from a childhood when my house was surrounded by fields and that flooded in the winter time was there was a bird called the lapwing and when they would appear in the fields my mother would say there's rain coming and sure enough it would happen if you read all these things about global warming I think we're due a tidal surge and that it won't the embankment won't stop it because there are gaps I wrote one time the saying that the tide might reach uh, St. Patrick's in Roden Place and people thought, well, that's fantastic. That couldn't happen. But you see it happening in other parts of the world where the global water is rising and Dundalk is a tidal town. So in my memory, I remember the tide coming in up and flooding that area where there are lots of houses now. And I'm waiting to see the day it does happen again. Even if you've lived in Dundalk your whole life, there's a very good chance you've never heard of the Lord Limerick Embankment. It may then surprise you to hear that it is the only thing standing between the Irish Sea and a sizeable portion of Dundalk Town. And furthermore, that it's crumbling. References in surveys and planning documents are often generic sounding, naming it simply the Salt Marsh Embankment or the Land Reclamation Embankment. But these do little to describe how vital the embankment is to the estimated 3,500 homes and businesses which owe their existence and continued safety to it. The Lord Limerick Embankment got its name from local environmental lobbyists who sought unsuccessfully to have urgent repair and upgrade works carried out by Louth County Council over the course of several recent decades. It was named for the man who built it almost three centuries beforehand, the mysterious and self-styled Lord Limerick. My name is Tara Tyne and in the first of this two-part documentary I will try to uncover the tale of the Lord Limerick and the ambitious plans he undertook in the borough of Dundalk all those years ago. Before the embankment was built, that's the early 1700s, there was, there was a port here from, from that period anyhow, and certainly before that, but it wasn't a port as we know, it was just a creek where uh, like a stream and sh small ships came in and just uh, discharged their cargoes on the beach uh, between here and Dundalk and uh, there was a little key right up at the big bridge, but there's very little record or known anything known about it. You know where the monument is in the fair green? Yes. Well, that was the first little key that I know of, but uh, it was a little round circular thing there and ships would come in there and just small little ships and discharge their cargo into the north gate as it was known then. There was no newspapers or anything record recorded that I know of. <laughs> And Harold O'Sullivan, when he was alive, um, did a lot of research in the Tower of London and uh, got very little information about the maritime life of Dundalk. The embankment was b built not to protect property or anything, but to reclaim ground for farm farmer use. That's why Lord, uh, why he, Limerick did it. Uh, it was to reclaim it. It's the third embankment, believe it or not. The first one ran from little shop up there at the where the the football teams are up there up that pint road here there was an embankment from there across to to hardy's house but uh, that goes through the end of the avenue road where the roundabout is and it went on then but it was a very small um, type of embankment but that stopped the tide getting in beyond that the tide at one time went right up to hill street that was built. The second one was never built. And then Lord Limerick built his embankment that we know of or know very little about. So who was this Lord Limerick? And what ambition had driven him to reclaim these new territories for Dundalk Town from the Irish Sea by undertaking the building of an embankment over three kilometres in length between the Soldiers Point and Black Rock? To begin with, like many of his ancestors, his name was James Hamilton and he was born in 1691 to Anne Mordaunt, 
daughter of the first Viscount of Mordaunt, who was a constable of Windsor Castle, and to James Hamilton of Tullymore, County Down, who was a descendant of both the Magnus clan of Ulster and to a long line of Scottish royalists. Way back in the 1690s, in the wake of the Battle of the Boyne, two Scottish entrepreneurs came over here and they bought the title from the Dungannon estate. Now, Dungannon was Marcus Trevor, who came by the title from supporting Charles II in the English Civil War. But when he died, he left the whole place bankrupt. And uh, according to uh, the Book of Dundalk, I'm quoting here from this book, that James Hamilton and James Fulbert arrived in uh, Dublin in 1587 to serve the interests of James the Sixth of Scotland, who, of course, was James the Third of England. The Hamiltons outmaneuvered Sir Hugh Montgomery, who had purchased the colonies to the greater spoil of the possessions. Around the early 1600s, Hamilton's great-grandfather and namesake had been awarded a large tract of land in County Down. Like some kind of early experiment, this estate had been awarded to Hamilton, the first Viscount of Clannaboy, several years before the plantations of Ulster had even begun. He'd been an agent and informant for the Scottish King James VI in Ireland, keeping him abreast of Queen Elizabeth I's actions in Ireland, and trying to drum up Irish support for James's succession to the English throne upon the eventual death of the Queen. The newly created Tullymore estate was his reward for this work and while seating himself at Bangor, he continued to expand and improve his new estate and holdings, inviting tenants from the Scottish lowlands and members of his close family to reside there. Upon his death, it all passed down to the next James Hamilton, who later became the first Earl of Clumbrassel in return for raising a regiment of foot and a troop of horse in support of Charles I. These had been maintained at his own expense for a period of eight years during an outbreak of civil war in England. He had also sat in the Irish House of Commons as an MP for Down at the age of 16. And at the age of 20, he had been betrothed to Lady Mary Boyle, the 13-year-old daughter of the first Earl of Cork. The marriage plans fizzled out, however, when Mary defied social expectations and refused to marry Hamilton telling her father that she found him physically repulsive. Being fond of his strong-willed daughter, her father conceded. The young Hamilton's plans were then further scuppered by the confiscation of his lands by Oliver Cromwell, the year after he inherited them. He was allowed to buy them back a decade later for the equivalent of about £1 million in today's money. It was his son, the Lord Limerick's father, known simply as James Hamilton of Tullymore, who made the expansion of this estate into the town of Dundalk, having bought the lands from Colonel Mark Trevors of Ross Trevor in the wake of the Williamite Wars. This was a considerable development for the estate of the Hamilton family, and his son, our young Lord Limerick, took on the challenge of his father's expansion with great zeal. He set about designing much of what we recognise today as the landscape of Dundalk Town. Dundalk House, the seat of his estate in Louth, was situated in front of St Nicholas's Church, known locally as the Green Church. When staying here, the Hamilton family's food supply would have been stored in what we now know as Icehouse Hill. Incidentally, their home on Church Street would later be bought and transformed into another iconic landmark by the PJ Carroll Tobacco Company, who built their factory there in 1824. Like many of his forebears, Hamilton wasn't one for sitting on his laurels. He studied law at Oxford and spent time in the Irish House of Lords, as well as representing several English constituencies in the British House of Commons in later life. Indeed, it was the Lord Limerick who put forward the bill for a seminary to train priests, in order to prevent the practice becoming a coercive underground movement, although it was to be some years before the seminary at Minut was actually established. But most importantly to our story, the young and diligent James Hamilton had architectural and perhaps social ambitions to create something tangible and lasting. And as such, his mark on Dundalk's landscape is an indelible one. It was his vision that created most of the streets which lead to the market square in Dundalk, 
He had toured Europe extensively in hopes of learning how to effectively develop his own properties at Tullymore and Louds at a time when wartime tensions made others squeamish at the prospect. It was at this point in my researches that it occurred to me why my younger self had enjoyed my visits to Paris so much. It hadn't been obvious to me back then how much I was reminded of home when I sauntered down Parisian boulevards. It hadn't seemed strange that Dundalk should have so many wide and tree-lined avenues leading inevitably to the sea. Mere coincidence. Didn't all Irish towns have these? But of course, they don't. In this way, Dundalk is set apart and the symmetry and intended beauty of the place was far from coincidence. Castle Road, St Mary's Road, Jocelyn Street and the Long Avenue are among the most iconic examples of the avenues the Lord Limerick had hoped to replicate from his exhaustive note-taking on topics such as architecture, landscaping, gardens and forestry, religion, taxation, history, education and military matters. In particular, it was the stately homes and estates along the River Seine in Paris which inspired his grand plan for his new town of Dundalk and the extra 1,800 or so acres which would soon be reclaimed from the sea and added to his holdings. We'll talk about the Long Avenue because originally it was called the Grand Avenue. When I was a child, um, I do recall that there were trees on either side so it was a real avenue of trees at one time. During the wartime, emergency people went down, cut down the trees for fuel, and that's where the avenue went to. One of the uh, ancestors of Lord Limerick, I don't think it had been Lord Limerick himself, had an idea that they were going to build a, um, a manor house behind the embankment at the end of what was known as the Green Avenue, which is an extension of the Long Avenue. Now, there is a not belief that the, the uh, Long Avenue is exactly one mile in length. It's not true, it's slightly longer. Uh, but that's just by chance. But older people that worked in the railway said there was really ornamental gates in the old railway works that were meant to be at the top of uh, the Long Avenue at the Hill Street end, but that they never got around to putting them up. Mainly because when they went to look to build the house, they discovered the foundations on reclaimed land wouldn't support a large house. And I do recall being at council meetings where the engineers came in and said you couldn't build anything in there for maybe a hundred years. So who knows who was right. Of course, the ambitious plans of the Lord Limerick seemed to be mostly self-serving. Whilst developing his new townlands, he made no plans whatsoever to improve shipping for Dundalk Bay. On the contrary, he was more concerned about drawing upon available resources in order to realise a plan of this magnitude. If you'd ever wondered where Dundalk's ancient town walls went to, this might help answer that question. When he got the lands in Dundalk, he set about changing the whole outlook of the area, pulling down old castles and dumping them into the harbour to make harbour works. And as a result, he changed the whole face of Dundalk. But we move on then to a slightly later period when we're talking about the port of Dundalk. And uh, Duffy in the book uh, says that the expenditure of money was entrusted to Lord Limerick. This is by the old Irish Parliament. He says it was alleged that uh, he utilised a portion of it for the construction of a rampart from uh, Soldier's Point uh, towards Black Rock. Duffy goes on to comment, which is a kind of uh, political comment, may or may not be true, which improved the adjoining land without aiding the efficiency of the harbour. Now, we see what he was up to, and uh, various people in the town challenged his right to those lands in there. Those lands remained with his family's estate until the early part of the last century, the 20th century, when there became an issue about the drainage of it. And rather than go, go to law, the then heir of Roden wrote off the title to the Dundalk Urban District Council, which had been created in 1899. So that's how the Dundalk Urban District Council got the title for the rampart and how it uh, has now passed on to the Life County Council. Acquired and developed under colonial power structures, 
The portion of Dundalk which stretches from the embankment just behind the old Coast Guard's cottages on the Lower Point Road, right up as far as Sea Town to Marhevna Moor, out as far as Black Rock, has since been handed back to Louth County Council and, consequently, to a string of property developers. Surely during the past century or so of public ownership, there have been some improvements to this vital piece of infrastructure, or at least basic repair works to keep above water the thousand plus acres of land which now holds the Point Road, the Lokers, Bay Estate, the Green Acres Complex and Alphonsus Road, Marhevna Moor and the Long Avenue, right up as far as Banners Bog on the other side of the Dublin Road. It is rather shocking then to find out that no such works have ever been carried out. Indeed, a trek along the overgrown embankment reveals some dangerously exposed, gaping holes in the clay structure. It's reasonable to believe that these are eroding with each tide, and that without any reinforcement or repair, we might expect to see more holes appear at the lowering of any high tide. I went in search of answers as to why those responsible for maintenance of our local public infrastructure haven't as yet seen fit to carry out these essential works. My first stop was with former town councillor Eamon O'Boyle, who was very vocal about the issue during his time with Dundalk Town Council. I live in Dundalk since 1970. I came here to work in the De La Salle College. I went for the town council election in 2004 and I served as t- for 10 years in the town council. And in 2008-2009, I was the vice chair of the council, the town council, and I was the chair in uh, 2013-14. It was only when I got involved in the town council that I became more fully aware of it. And uh, uh, certainly um, when estimates were coming up and when we were framing a budget, money was being set aside for various uh, activities and so forth. And I investigated what was the Lord Limerick Embankment and discovered over to my horror that it was um, originally um, built or constructed or whatever you'd say uh, in uh, 1730 I believe reclaimed around uh, I think around two or three thousand acres of ground in the, this area of, of Dundalk and it uh, kept the flood out. In fact, uh, I was told by an elderly person, they remembered the uh, sea coming up to the back gate of the old Protestant church uh, on Mary Street, uh, right up all the way. And uh, uh, certain in Sea Town and places along there were, were prone to flooding. And in my own time now, I have noticed that flooding has become more pronounced, particularly up the RD Road. I see it in Pierce Park. Particularly, I suppose, the first time I noticed it to some great effect was on the Castletown Road where it, the the bridge where the bridge was that that way became very badly flooded in several locations, and um, I I just wondered why was this happening and what what could we do to preserve it and then I it was read the Copenhagen meeting of the climate change people started to speak up and uh, I realised that we were in this whole idea of climate change now there are a lot of naysayers about it, a lot of people who would say that it doesn't exist, it's a figment of the imagination, but I think you want to be terribly blind, if not totally deaf, to, uh, not to realise that um, that it's happening and it's coming quicker than we realise. We're told that the melting of the ice caps yeah, is happening at such an alarming rate. Uh, that we could have a metre to two metres of a rise in the sea levels around the, uh, the world, never mind around Dundalk. And if that were to happen, Dundalk, would, uh, I would reckon that it could be up to 10,000 premises, uh, houses or homes could be under under a metre or maybe a, a couple of feet of water. And we've seen this in places that never experienced uh, flooding before. So flooding is a real danger and it's only came, uh, the media has brought it to our attention now in recent times. I remember uh, down, I was, went home to the west of Ireland where I come from and I was coming back from Galway and I, and the new road into Galway and I was amazed that they, as far as the eye could see in both directions travelling around that new road it was just like a sea the flooding this was around 2009 and at that time I, when I came back uh, to Nandok I was coming back for a council meeting I had got a, an email from one of the engineers here in town 
and uh, he told me that the Lord Limerick Embankment was at serious risk of being washed away from flooding and I've been watching that for uh, with uh, with bated breath as it were certainly uh, very much uh, fearful that if it were to happen I reckon that about three and a half maybe five thousand homes in the immediate vicinities around the, the bay will be it will be under serious water damage. Any of you who regularly take the Rock Road, as it's known, between Black Rock and Dundalk, will be familiar with the flooding that happens there on an occasional high tide. You might not, however, be entirely familiar with the reason why. If you're travelling from Dundalk to Black Rock, just as you pass the entrance to the Lokers housing estate, look out to your left to where the tree line on the near horizon stops suddenly and pointedly. This is the end of the Lord Limerick Embankment itself. The trees you see are the overgrowth on top of it. One of my interviewees, who we'll speak to in the next part, assures me that the embankment was meant to be carried on the full way to Black Rock. It seems that the Lord Limerick may have left it unfinished upon his death in 1758. Although records from the time are so sparse that it's impossible to confirm either his original intentions or the reason for the estimated 3 to 500 metre gap between the end of the embankment and Black Rock. Additionally, according to former town councillor Eamon O'Boyle, as we've just heard, we have fluvial flooding from the Blackwater, Ramparts and Castletown rivers to contend with too, as Dundalk Bay pushes back at high tide. My next stop was with a current sitting member of Louth County Council, Emma Coffey, to see if any developments had been made since Eamon had retired in 2013. We have got from the OPW um, basically... I think it's now 58 million to, to basically to, to re-upgrade the embankment. And of that 58 million, 50 million of that is going actually on the Dundalk uh, Blackrock embankment. So this is a 10 year contract that is going to be restoring it. Now, some of them are going to be temporary and some of them are going to be permanent. Um, I do believe that there has to be a balance. We've had environmental impact statements, assessments that have been carried out. We've had pre-tendering works and programme of works car- basically submitted by for a state contract to ensure that the least impact as possible can be carried out in that area. As I say, it's a protected area. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty. And if you're saying, do I think we can capitalise it? Of course we can. If we're going to spend 50 million, we've got to 50 million in this area, we should be looking at how we can ensure that that area is protected and that everybody, not just the the people of Dundalk, but that it becomes a tourist attraction. It's been 15 months at time of recording since I spoke to Councillor Coffey. I called Loud County Council Planning Department just today to ask about the current status of the embankment. I was directed to a two-page flood relief scheme newsletter on floodinfo.ie, the first and apparently only part of a series which was released nine months ago. It mentions the UK-based Binney's engineering firm and their Dublin contractors Black and & Veatch and Nicholas O'Dwyer carrying out yet more mountains of surveys and analysis as we've been hearing for many decades now. And there's seemingly no end in sight. The Lord Limerick Embankment isn't even directly mentioned in the document, although the person I spoke to in council planning had assured me it was being considered in the plans for Dundalk and RD and the €86 million Euro budget which has been assigned for them. I tried contacting one of Black and Veach's team who has played a prominent role in the planning thus far. He wasn't available for comment. Staring at the full moon outside my window, I find myself wondering how high the tide is tonight. How clean is the river which runs near my house? Would it even make a difference if the sea rose by one or two metres? Or three? Tune in to part two of High Tide in Dundalk Bay, where we speak to a flooding expert from Met Aaron and hear more about the previous attempts of lobbyists to repair and improve the Lord Limerick Embankment. We'll also investigate some of the commonly cited obstacles to these works by Loud County Council and speak to local residents about their experiences of living on unprotected, reclaimed land during a climate crisis. Thanks to Peter Kavanagh, Charlie McCarthy, Eamon O'Boyle and Emma Coffey for their contributions in part one. Thanks also to Dundalk FM for their assistance in making this documentary. This programme was partially funded by the BAI under the Sound and Vision Initiative. High Tide in Dundalk Bay was produced and presented by myself, Tara Tyne. With sound recording by David Bellew.